Welcome to the Capital News. I am your host, Alex Caritas. Today is Tuesday, May 12th, 2020. Thank you so much for joining me. Title of today's podcast, what's another three trillion, right? Amongst friends, who cares? Three trillion, six trillion, nine, twelve, twenty-four, fifty-six and a half. It really doesn't make any difference. This is the new stimulus package that Nancy Pelosi is throwing out there. Of course, we have had discussions about what was coming next. We've had discussions about the Federal Reserve saying they're going to spend and do and print whatever it takes. Steven Mnuchin, Treasury Secretary, we're going to spend, we're going to do whatever it takes. Nancy Pelosi, another $3 trillion. So we're going to talk about that. But before we get into it, I just want to go over some of the titles of our podcast over the past couple of weeks, just so you can understand what's going on here. All right, so this is a couple weeks ago. The domino effect, the oil conundrum, no earnings, who cares, jobs down, stocks up, America, the final chapters, and down goes oil, more, 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 the banana republic is here, gold, oil, and war, a weekly wrap-up, the real economy, a barrel of problems, state bailouts next, and market manipulation, a total collapse, nationalization, and negative rates, unlimited, quote-unquote, stimulus. Catching what's going on here? You get the theme of what's taking place? I think these are all pretty much hitting the nail square on the head. A total collapse, historic jobs report, more, 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 because we're going to talk about negative rates, $3 trillion more, so there's more, 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 there's your unlimited quote-unquote stimulus, nationalization, state bailouts coming next because $1 trillion of the $3 trillion, at least right now as it stands from the Democratic side of things, is for the states, market manipulation, I mean, my God, it's been market manipulation for how many years now? But what's another $3 trillion? Market performance, we'll get to that first. The market's actually sold off today. The Dow gave back about 457 points. Across the board, it was red. The small caps gave back about 3%. Right now, in the futures trading, we have the Dow Jones and the S&P 500 both down about a quarter to three-tenths of 1%. The NASDAQ 100 just went green, but it is relatively flat. Japanese markets are down four-tenths of 1%, a mixed bag across the pond over, over in Europe. We'll leave it at that. And the Australian markets are currently trading down about four-tenths of 1%. On the commodity front, we have WTI trading at $25.58 a barrel, Brent at $29.50 a barrel, natural gas getting whacked again, $1.69 per million British thermal units. Gold is at $1,702 an ounce, and silver $15.49 per ounce. A little bit of a flight to safety. Back to the U.S. 10-year Treasury note, yielding 0.65%. Now, no surprise to us here, of course. Today, the government announced a record deficit for the month of April. Negative $738 billion. This compares to a year ago when it was actually a surplus in the month of April of $160 billion, but not so much this year. This year we were in the red ink deep $738 billion budget deficit. And we're just getting started because we know that we're going to be borrowing a net $3 trillion for the second quarter alone, which of course includes the month of April. And now if Nancy Pelosi gets her way and if Jay Powell, the Federal Reserve, gets his way and the president and... Steven Mnuchin get their way, there's going to be another trillion, two trillion, three trillion in the next round, right? And they can all claim that they're in no hurry. We're out of money finally. We can put, oh, oh, the young people, the future generations, woe is them. They're going to have to pay for this. You know, they didn't give a damn a few weeks ago. Now all of a sudden they're concerned about it. I don't think so. I don't think it. I don't think so. It's just political jostling, just political positioning. That's all that is. It's just a bunch of nonsense. They're going to continue to spend whatever it takes. Well, then why don't you add another zero to all of our stimulus checks or whatever you're giving us, right? Twelve hundred. Make it twelve thousand. That'll hold people over, right? If there's no cost to this, if debts and deficits do not matter, then why give us some easily twelve hundred dollars? Make it twelve grand. Why won't they do it? Why won't reporters ask the president this? Why won't they ask Mnuchin these questions or Larry Kudlow or Peter Navarro 
or Nancy Pelosi. Why not give it twelve thousand, one hundred and twenty grand? That'll surely take care of it if you give everybody one hundred twenty thousand. Hey, we're good. We're good. We're just gonna sit on our hands. You take your time getting your vaccines, your therapies. Everything will be just fine. If it doesn't matter, then why don't they do that? What's this twelve hundred dollar crap? Go big or go home, baby. What is this? Three trillion, at least again, as I stated at the top of the podcast, at least one trillion of this is to be slated for the states. And if we go back to our trusty usdebtclock.org and you look at total state debt, this is just total state debt, you have outstanding $1.2 trillion. If you look at local debt, it's $2 trillion. Now, of course, this isn't going to be a $1 trillion check that just wipes all of this state debt out. Oh, no, no, no. This is just simply to keep the lights on. This is just to keep it going. That's all this is. This is just to make pension funds continue because, of course, they got shellacked in the first quarter of this year. And we'll see what happens with this market sell-off today because it sold off aggressively in the last few minutes of trading which is typically a sign that there is some cracks in the foundation. Now, one day, of course, does not make a trend, but this is something worth paying attention to. Nothing goes straight up, nothing goes straight down, despite the massive decline that we saw a couple months ago and despite the massive rally that we've been witnessing for the past several weeks. So is this going to be the start of another correction? And what does that correction mean? Is it 5%, 10%? Is this just going to turn into some sort of consolidation where the market will then sort of figure out what it wants to do and then go even higher? Or again, is this going to be the start of maybe something even bigger than a correction, testing the lows, maybe going through the lows? Time will tell, but we know that the federal government and the Federal Reserve wants to throw everything they possibly can at the markets, at the economy to see what sticks and to keep these markets at extremely overvalued levels, everything be damned, they don't care. They don't care. And that's what I'm saying. If they don't care and none of this matters, then alleviate everybody of their financial stresses and give them 120,000. Give them 12,000. Even 12,000 they'd be happy with. That might do some serious damage, right? People could really pay off some debts. People could really start to have savings then maybe. If it doesn't matter, of course, this audience knows that it does. But how very tempting is it, right? Because it's so politically convenient, it's so politically profitable for Democrats and Republicans to come out and say, oh yeah, we're just going to give you more money as opposed to looking the American people in the eye and telling them what's been going on. And of course, yesterday, American Dream or Ponzi scheme, I mean, that could have been a three-hour podcast. If I had really put down notes, if I had really written something beforehand, that could have been three hours. Easily. Easily. That could be the whole purpose, the whole theme of this entire podcast from here and for years to come. Digging deeper and deeper, other every single layer of the onion, completely, is what this is. It, it is a Ponzi scheme. I hope we made that very clear yesterday, and we've discussed that many times here before as well. I mean, we didn't even scratch the surface on so many other things just on the surface of usdebtclock.org, which I hope all of you have checked out and do so from time to time. Don't look at it every day. You'll go crazy. But every once in a while, and we like to talk about it every once in a while here because it is just a good source of information in one place. And when you understand how everything is connected, it really paints a good picture for you. So more stimulus spending is on the way. Donald Trump, Mitch McConnell, Mnuchin, they can all play hardball. Nancy Pelosi can all play hardball. They can all do what they want to do. More money is going to be coming down the pike sooner or later. Okay? The question is, what's going to be the price tag? Phase four, phase five, six, seven, eight. It's a political year, a presidential election. Nobody wants to be caught with their pants down saying, oh, well, well, why didn't you help us? Why didn't you give us some money? No politician wants to be blamed for that. So it's very politically profitable for them to just say, we're going to borrow the money, we're going to spend the money, we're going to have the Federal Reserve backstop us and print the money. No consequences whatsoever. And they're never pushed. Again, which just tells you how big of a sham the mainstream media is and the financial mainstream media as well. These are simple, basic questions that a college freshman should be able to ask once they have had a couple courses in economics and finance. Common sense would 
simply bring you to these conclusions, even if you didn't have those or take those classes? How's it paid for? Where's the money coming from? What are the costs? Is there a free lunch? No, there isn't. So who's going to bear the cost? Because the other thing that's starting to get peddled around, and even Nancy Pelosi this evening in an interview with Jim Cramer, was discussing negative interest rates and saying now's the time to borrow even more money. So look, folks, how many times do I have to tell you that this is a big game, it's a big charade in front of your face? This is WWE. This is professional wrestling. They're all on the same page. Donald Trump's been crying for negative rates for years. He's about to get them. He is about to get them. Nancy Pelosi. Hey, negative rates, great time to borrow. Steven Mnuchin. Negative rates, low rates, great time to refinance the national debt. What could possibly go wrong? So here you have it. Once again, negative rates front and center. We talked about this the other day as well because the federal funds futures market has hit negative territory early into next year. So what does that tell us? Right, That's the future. That's in the future. Early next year. It's telling us that the markets see no growth. They see no growth. Perhaps a deflationary environment. But there is not going to be any type of V-shaped, miraculous recovery within the U.S. economy. Or elsewhere, for that matter, because you understand the interconnectedness of the global system. Negative interest rates coming, and of course you have several members from the Federal Reserve coming out and saying, well, you know, we really don't think that we want to do this. Jay Powell is supposed to give a speech, I believe, tomorrow, pretty much coming out to say, no, nah, we, we don't think this is the right thing to do. Jay Powell has been consistent when it comes to negative rates and wanting to shy away from them, to not adopt them here in the country. Uh, but, you know, you, you can't trust this guy as far as you can throw him. Because a year and a half ago, he said, we're on autopilot, baby. Federal Reserve balance sheet, it's on autopilot. We're going back to some type of normalization here. Because it took the Federal Reserve's entire history from 1913, 1914 to the depths of the great financial crisis to have a balance sheet that was about $800, $900 billion. Okay? Then they started the monstrosity known as quantitative easing and increased it by over a trillion dollars. Okay? Then they did it again, and they did it again, and they did it again taking us to about 4.5, 4.6 trillion in assets on the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. Then all of a sudden, after, you know, 10, 12 years of the longest expansion ever in the history of the United States of America, also the weakest, but the longest. Okay, finally, we have somewhat of a good economy, they said, which was a total crock of you-know-what, but that was the story. Everything seems to be okay. Right. And then of course, in this week period, it was there were things were that were peaking, things that were turning up. Right. But that's the business cycle. At the end of the growth period, you're at the top. That's what signals that you're at the top. That's it. You can't you're not going any further. Now you go down. So they said, OK, if we're going to do any type of normalization, now's the time to do it when there's some type of strength, some semblance of strength in the U.S. economy, because we'll be out of ammunition. If we go into a recession, and recessions, of course, have not been outlawed, so we want to have some type of ammunition, meaning interest rate cuts, the ability to expand the balance sheet and it not be ridiculous. All that's been thrown to the wind now, right? But that was Jay Powell. We're going to go back to some sort of normalization. It's on autopilot. I don't know what normalization meant. I don't know what that number meant. Are we going to go from $4.5 trillion down to 3 down to 2 down to $1? Because remember, again, $800, $900 billion for 100 years. That's how long it took to get there. And then they're starting to go up in tens of billions, hundreds of billions of dollars in increments, up to $4.5, $4.6 trillion. Now, over the past couple of months, we've added over $2 trillion to the Fed's balance sheet. And there's no end in sight. There's no end in sight. They're slowing down the pace of increase, of course. But, I mean, I would hope so. I would hope so. Even the slowing pace is still as significant as previous QEs, QE1, QE2, Operation Twist, QE3. It's still on par with that, even though it's slowed down significantly. Because they had all of these quote-unquote emergency facilities and these fancy acronyms that we've discussed here before in a drawer collecting dust for the past 12 years, just waiting to be used again to see sunshine. And they got it, and they didn't hesitate this time. They did not hesitate. And the reason they didn't hesitate is because of what we discussed yesterday. 
that this system is a Ponzi scheme. And if they allowed it to all collapse, if they allowed true market capitalism, free market capitalism to hold, and for true price discovery to take hold, the game would be over. Everybody would know what a joke it is. But they're going to continue kicking this can as far down the road as possible. But again, getting back to Jay Powell, can't trust him. The economy at that time, year and a half ago, late 2018, you had interest rates get to two and a quarter, two and a half percent. Apparently, the economy couldn't take it. Wall Street definitely couldn't take it. They collapsed 20 percent in the fourth quarter, really in the last couple of months of the year, being one of the worst December since the Great Depression. Thunder thumbs, President Trump threw a hissy fit like he does in conjunction with Wall Street. Oh, no, you can't do this. Federal Reserve, you can't do this. There's no normalization. You can't increase interest rates. They were at two and a quarter, two and a half percent. At a time, you're saying this is the greatest economy ever in the history of the United States of America, which, of course, is just baloney. How can it be the greatest economy ever, yet interest rates at two and a quarter, two and a half percent, and we can't tolerate it? Before the great financial crisis, they were five, six percent. Two and a quarter, two and a half, and we can't tolerate that? Now something's amiss. You don't have to be an economist to figure this one out. And down we went, and they started cutting rates, and down they went, and the repo madness, and all of that massacre, and that was supposed to be temporary. That's permanent. And now the Federal Reserve is basically complete, completely the repo market on both sides of it. So that's why there's not too much of a discussion on it anymore, because they've killed that market. They are the market, the Federal Reserve. But again, that goes right back to the Federal Reserve's credibility and that of the chairman, because he is the mouthpiece, he is the face of the Federal Reserve. Right? That was supposed to be temporary. It lasted for months. Now the market's obliterated, and it's just the Federal Reserve. So the guy is not to be trusted. No surprise. Nobody's to be trusted. President, Treasury Secretary, economic advisors, Democrats, Republicans in Congress, both houses, representatives and in the Senate, members of the Federal Reserve. These people are not to be trusted. None of them. None of them. And again, there's more calls for these negative rates. And the market is known to get what it wants. Throw a hissy fit, throw your tantrum, somebody's going to cave. Congress will cave, the president and the administration will cave, the Federal Reserve will cave, if not all three of them. If not all three. And right now it's been all three. It's bipartisan though. Isn't everybody happy? It's finally bipartisan. We're spending money we don't have on crap that shouldn't be spent on, but hey, it's bipartisan. Everybody should be happy. What's another three trillion? So is this part now with this sell-off, is it because, you know, the Federal Reserve might be taking a little bit of a harder stance against negative interest rates and the markets don't like that? Could this be the fact that today the Federal Reserve has actually started purchasing some of these corporate bonds through the ETF markets, right? Which, again, circumvents the Reserve Act, okay, the Federal Reserve Act, uh, again, just completely fraudulent. And illegal, in my opinion. But you know what? They create these special purpose vehicles, the SPVs, that, al that allows the Federal Reserve to circumvent this by going through the Treasury. And, and that's what you have. It's a roundabout. That's all it is. They're losing the game. They change the rules. You do that, you're going to end up screwed. But they can change the rules. Middle of the play, running down a field. Something goes wrong. Yep, we're going to change the rules. And there's nothing you can do about it. So now they're finally getting in making these purchases in the corporate debt market. And was this an event today that was sort of, you know, by the rumor, which we heard weeks ago, which started to help catapult these markets and where we are today, and now is it sell the news because now the reality has sunk in? And is this going to be a message from the markets, especially if this downturn continues? And again, it's just a day. It's just one day. But if this turns into a trend and gains momentum, is this a message from the market to the Fed? Hey, keep doing more. Keep doing more. And we know that that is not a market. It is a rigged game. It is a joke. It's just money printing. It's funny money. It's, it's funny money. It's counterfeit by definition. But it's sanctioned by the government for the Fed to do it. For the purpose of sustaining this system that is a Ponzi scheme by definition and in practice. So you got all of these players 
right in front of you on the same page. On the same page. This is just the entertainment value. This is just to throw a little drama out there. Oh, no, the Federal Reserve says they don't like negative interest rates. They don't think they're going to be good. The cost benefit of them, not going to make sense. Can't go down that route. Again, repo, normalization on autopilot. Rates are going up. We're not going to cut rates. They can't be trusted. So it's the same thing. We don't like negative rates. Markets pricing them in. We're going to get them. We already have real negative rates to begin with. And if you take that Federal Reserve study into consideration, which we've discussed here on multiple occasions, when you have a Federal Reserve balance sheet that expands or contracts, that acts as an interest rate cut or hike, respectively, in and of itself, after so many tens of billions of dollars. Well, I would think that over $2 trillion over the course of a couple months, month and a half, would constitute its own de facto rate cut. So putting us in negative territory right now. We just don't actually physically see that negative sign in front of the number. But it'll be there soon enough. And of course, the solution to all of this madness is higher interest rates, but that's not going to happen. That's just not going to happen. The only way they're going to ever do that is if inflation gets completely out of hand, where you have a not just an inflationary period, but a stagflation period, which is inflation with stagnant or no growth, okay, or hyperinflation. That's the only way they're going to step in and say, okay, we got to increase interest rates. Otherwise, they're going to tolerate it. Or they're going to come out and say, rates are low, uh, inflation rates are low, which is what came out today, which in part is true. We know that there are deflationary downward pressures on prices because of there's no their lack of demand for things. We understand this. And also that being a part of the deleveraging process that we should be going through. But nonetheless, you have to look at the basket of goods that people are really purchasing. Not the goods that they're not purchasing. What they are purchasing. And those goods are going up. And it's really getting down to the bare necessities. We talk about the food prices and what's going on there. The shortages that could take place, that are taking place, and could potentially get worse if nationalization around the rest of the world takes root and people don't want to ship and export their food products. They say, oh no, our people are starving. We're going to keep everything here. Best of luck to you, but we got to take care of our own. Or COVID-19 picks up and it, you know, it affects export markets because people can't work. Nobody's on the shipyards. Nothing's going out. Can't do it. That could happen. That could happen. All right, so that's the negative rates. Everybody's on the same page. Trump likes it. Mnuchin likes it. Nancy Pelosi likes it. Federal Reserve Chairman and some other members are playing the bad cop right now, but they'll cave like they always do. Everybody's on the same page. There's no difference amongst them. They're all ripping you off. Peaceful revolution. Leave the Republican Party. Leave the Democratic Party immediately if you haven't done so already. Please, do yourself and your country a favor. Quick headline, Boeing, because we've done several podcasts on them, Boeing is losing even more orders, especially related to the 737 MAX. This is no surprise. I'm sure the same thing is taking place with the European counterpart in with uh, Airbus, but at least that headline just to let you know what's going on there. So, what do we have left? I want to take the time to perhaps read an article from Bloomberg that has to deal with... Um, landlords and tenants and that type of stuff because this all ties in with some of this perhaps other round of stimulus quote-unquote stimulus this bailout of three trillion dollars especially when it comes to state and local debt and again check out usdebtclock.org to find that out but here is this article from bloomberg out earlier today if landlords get wiped out wall street wins not renters bans on evictions and rent strikes could push out small investors Nobody's bailing out Connecticut landlord Mary Beth Shields. More than half of the tenants in the 27 low-income apartments she owns in the city of West Haven and its vicinity aren't paying, and there's nothing she can do about it. The state banned evictions until July and allowed tenants hurt by the pandemic to defer with no penalty. But Shields can't pay either. Her profit last year came to only $24,000, and now she's behind on $1.2 million in mortgages. Like millions of other U.S. landlords who owe lenders more than $1 trillion combined, her fate is tied to renters now urgently focused on their own self-preservation. Quote, my tenants think I'm rich, end quote, Shield says, quote, they have better cars than me, better nails, and better tax refunds, end quote. 
The next housing crisis is here, and this time it's about rentals. Across the U.S., landlords and tenants are wrangling over next month's rent while an approaching avalanche of evictions threatens to bury them both. To avert a damaging wave of foreclosures like the one that swept the country more than a decade ago, Congress included a provision in the $2.2 trillion rescue package it approved in March that allows homeowners with government-backed mortgages to defer payments for up to one year. But Washington stopped short of offering renters comparable relief on the assumption that those in distress would likely qualify for the $1,200 checks the Treasury began mailing out in April, as well as beefed up unemployment benefits. In an Urban Institute survey of renters carried out from March 25th to April 10th, almost half said they had experienced material hardship in the previous month. Many U.S. states have imposed moratoriums on evictions, but without a national rental market bailout, the economic pain is likely to spread as efficiently as the virus that caused it, flowing upwards to landlords, their lenders, and here you got, here you have it, and cities losing property tax revenue. About half of the 43 million rental units in the country are owned by small businesses. Let me repeat that. About half of the 43 million rental units in the country are owned by small businesses, such as Shields One Woman Enterprise. Unless help comes soon, both renters and property owners will slide down the socioeconomic scale together, says Emily Benfer, a visiting law professor at Columbia University. It will have a ripple effect, she says. Rent doesn't just go to property owners. It pays for property taxes, mortgages, and salaries for the people who maintain those properties. States with large populations of renters, including California, Texas, New York, and Florida, have instituted temporary bans on evictions, but 23 others, among them Wyoming, North Dakota, Arkansas, Ohio, and Georgia, have adopted few, if any, protections for renters, says Benfer, who collaborated with researchers at Princeton University to create a state-by-state housing policy scorecard for the pandemic. Trade associations that represent landlords are lobbying Congress for $100 billion to cover some of the rent shortfall with direct payments to property owners, but they have yet to unite behind any of the various proposals floating in Congress. So this is just more delay. Lenders could be collateral damage, particularly regional banks that often finance local property investors. At the end of 2019, there was a one there was 1.6 trillion of outstanding mortgage debt on multifamily properties in the U.S., according to Paula Munger, vice president of research at the National Apartment Association, the NAA, citing a Fed study. Defaults in the last recession reached 5% and could climb to as high as 10% during this much deeper downturn, she says. I'll repeat, defaults in the last recession, the great financial crisis, reached 5%. She believes they could double to 10% during this downturn. Many landlords operate on thin margins, typically nine cents for every dollar, according to the NAA, and have nowhere to turn for help if their rental income dries up. Most don't qualify for federal mortgage forbearance because only about a third have mortgages backed by Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, or another federal agency. The Small Business Administration is bolstering companies that keep workers employed. But many property owners don't have a payroll. Shields, who tours the property with a lawnmower crammed into the back of her Toyota Prius, handles most everything herself and hires contractors for the rest. I mean, the article continues, and this is just what we have been stating. This is a death by a thousand cuts. This is the domino effect. You know, here's where you, have, where you really run into these problems, amongst so many other things. People stop paying the rent because they got to pay for food. They want to save up. They got to pay other debts off. They say, you know, screw you. They have this vision of a landlord that everybody's rich and wealthy when that's not the case, clearly. As we've been stating here many times, you know, a lot of mom and pops have some real estate. They want to turn it into their nest egg, right? But they're still carrying a mortgage and they're relying on that rent being paid so they can pay the mortgage for their rental property. In addition, they probably have a mortgage for their own property, their own house as well. So this is just going to continue to multiply and multiply and multiply. Because what to do if your renters don't pay? Do you evict them? Or do you try to work out some sort of agreement with them? Because it's costly, right? You have to find somebody. Is that person, are they going to be credit worthy? Are they going to have a job in this situation? Are they going to pay? You already know the tenant that you have 
Is it worth the risk of getting rid of them to get somebody new that you don't know? These are the whole host of unknowns that remain out there. And for people to be enthusiastically behind pent-up demand and a V-shaped recovery, I don't know where it's coming from. It just defies logic, and it serves nobody any good anywhere. And that's what you have. I mean, you have people on these rental strikes, which is something that was discussed in this article here. I mean, once people understand, and, you know, and to this point, with this one here, in this same article, when they talk about the renter strike, one of the people that they interviewed who's doing this says, you know, I understand that the landlord isn't, you know, Mr. Uncle Pennybags or whatever to go to call, you know, all this money. But you know what? I got to look out for myself. I have some self-preservation here too. But at the end of the day, we're just a pass through for the banks. I'm paraphrasing. But, you know, people are starting to wake up to what we have been stating here for months, for months that you are just going to be a pass-through. This isn't rocket science. I say it here all the time. You don't have to be an economist to put these dots together. Just a little bit of common sense. Step back, deep breath, what's going on? People are going to start waking up, if they haven't already, to the fact that they are just a pass-through. Here's your 1200 Here's your two grand. Sit down and shut up. Give it to the bank. And give it to your landlord so your landlord can give it to the bank. All right? And this is all going to come down to consolidation. These smaller regional banks who are heavily invested when it comes to oil, natural gas, the shell revolution, when it comes to these types of properties, which was noted in this article. And now you're going to have those banks suffer, consolidation, right? And then you're likely to have, as concluded in this article, who wins? But Wall Street, big investors, hedge funds, same group of people who benefited from a collapsing housing market during the depths of the great financial crisis because they had the money. So people get evicted, they get kicked out of their house, small businesses like this can't stay afloat, they're gone, properties go onto the market, these guys have all the money, all the funny money, because they're close to the Federal Reserve, they're buddy-buddy with Washington, D.C., they get the money, they stay afloat, and then they go up and scoop these properties up for pennies on the dollar. And then they rent them out. Can't lose. See the game? Can you connect the dots? Are you getting the picture? I hope so. What's another $3 trillion? Well, we're about to find out. Thank you so much for joining me today, ladies and gentlemen. Please like, share, subscribe, get the word out, leave your comments. We do love hearing from you. Stay diversified, stay vigilant, and stay with the Capital News. I am Alex Caritas. Godspeed.